Hello, everyone. We're just going to give a couple of minutes for everyone to come in, and then we will start the session. All right, let's begin. Good afternoon, and thank you for attending the Arts in the Libraries virtual festival. Today's session is the, is the art scene in Hampton Roads 200 years ago. As a reminder, you can submit questions throughout the session, which we will be answering at the end of the presentation and we will get to as many as time permits. Dr. Robert Witovich is Professor of Art History and Vice Provost and Dean of the Graduate School at Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia. He has previously served as Associate Vice Provost for Graduate Studies in 2014 to 2016 Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the College of Arts and Letters in 2006 to 2014, and the Chair of the, art de of the Department of Art in 1999 to 2005. Dr. Witovich received his PhD in the History of Art from the University of Pennsylvania in 1990, his MA in Art History and Archaeology from Columbia University in 1984, and his MA and BA in American Civilization from the University of Pennsylvania in 1983. His research focuses on architectural history, urban history, and historic preservation. An expert on the life and, the, and work of critic Lewis Mumford, 1895 to 1990, Dr. Witovich is the author of Lewis Mumford and American Modernism, published in 1996, the editor of Sidewalk Critic Lewis Mumford's Writings on New York, published in 1998, and Mumford on Modern Art in the 1930s, released in 2007, and the co-editor with Bruce Brooks Pfeiffer of Frank Lloyd Wright and Lewis Mumford 30 Years of Correspondence, published in 2001. When artist Joshua Shaw passed through Norfolk 200 years ago, he encountered a borough recovering from a nationwide financial panic, but also brimming with construction and activity. He was especially fortunate to be received into the small community of artist travelers that had gathered around businessman Thomas Williamson, who entertained guests frequently at his Norfolk townhouse and at Ferryville, his nearby country estate. This presentation will focus on Shaw, Dunlap, and the small but lively group of artists who started Norfolk's first artistic awakening. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Robert Witovich. Thank you, Gary, for that um, very 
lovely introduction and it did make me think of how old I am actually. Um, and that's a good thing uh, because I've seen a lot and um, uh, I've had a lot of time actually to think about this particular topic. So thank you all for attending uh, this presentation and also for attending the Arts and Libraries Virtual Festival, uh, which I think is a nice way of spotlighting the good things that we have in our collections here on campus and also throughout uh, the region. So um, I'll get started. And um, the overview that uh, Gabe provided does provide you um, with um, good context uh, for what I'm about to uh, talk to you about today. Um, as she mentioned, 200 years ago, Hampton Rose in Norfolk in particular was home to a rather vibrant art scene uh, that indirectly as a result of its role as a national and international maritime hub. And so lots of people are passing in and out of town. And these um, include uh, quite a number of uh, prominent artists. Uh, this presentation's focus will be the work of the English born artist, Joshua Shaw, who swept through Norfolk in the winter of 1819, 1820, and who left a pictorial legacy of Norfolk and Portsmouth's working waterfront uh, the shipyards, the warehouses, the docks, and the windmills, as well as the rural areas to the east of the Metropolitan Center. So, so that would be essentially Princess Anne County, which would be Virginia Beach today. And I'm going to go back for a second because I, I like um, the, uh, the general view of this, um, uh, this scene showing downtown Norfolk. And I just showed you that detail right here because it also shows some of the activities that are still in process today. And so it is the shipbuilding. This is the Gosport Shipyard, which is now Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth. Uh, so it's down the southern branch of the Elizabeth River, looking up to um, Norfolk Kier, where the southern and the eastern branches split. Not really obvious here. And by the way, um, this is the USS Delaware um, under construction. Um, that was a warship of the same um, uh, naval uh, vessel class as the, U the more famous USS Constitution, which is now birthed uh, in Boston Harbor and the oldest uh, uh, working warship evidently in the world. Uh, this is actually a peninsula, uh, what would be, uh, we would think of as Berkeley today and uh, Windmill Point uh, defined by a windmill and a reminder of our, our persistent interest in wind power in this region. Um, uh, is shown here. And then of course, the watermen uh, working, you know, plying the river, uh, dredging for oysters, uh, fishing and the like. Shaw's visit to Norfolk and its environs was documented in the small exhibition that I co-curated with Corey Piper. Uh, he is the Chrysler Museum of Arts Curator of American Art. And our um, exhibition went up uh, in fall of 2019 and was extended due to the pandemic through the summer of 2020. As seen in the introductory label, we titled uh, the exhibition Waterscape, Picturesque Views of Hampton Roads. We paired Shaw's 18th century prints, and there are three of them. There's the view of uh, downtown Norfolk that I just showed you and a couple of rural views. Uh, with um, contemporary photographs by um, a photographer named Scott Jost, panoramic views actually showing roughly the same uh, locations. And so, for example, in the bottom view here, I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, this is roughly the same, a little bit north of the, uh, the shipyard, but a view from downtown Norfolk, from downtown Portsmouth rather into Norfolk and then the, um, the branching of the river. We um, were able to uh, draw on um, quite a number of historical resources uh, for this project. Um, and so the Hofheimer Art Library and the uh, uh, Perry Library, of course, uh, always a kind of starting place uh, for my research, uh, but also the Sargent Memorial Collection uh, down at the Slover Library, um, and then the, um, the actual print collections of the Chrysler Museum of Art and the Mariners Museum in Newport News. And of course, we used interlibrary loan. Now, you'll find this um, to be a bit odd, but this interest in what was happening in the art scene 200 years ago um, pops out of a larger study that I'm working on and have been working on for quite a long time. I hate to even say how long, 
on Norfolk's bank architecture during the antebellum period. And I'm showing you a photograph, the large view here, possibly the oldest photograph of the Norfolk subject uh, dating from roughly um, 1862. There's not a precise date on it, uh, but it is during the time of the Civil War and the occupation by Union troops. And you can see uh, Union, it's kind of a ragtag formation marching um, up the block here. Okay, it shows a Bank Street in downtown Norfolk. This is a um, street that still survives, although parts of it have been buried under MacArthur Center. Uh, they are, um, excuse me, the um, street is lined at the time with uh, 19th century uh, townhouses, uh, larger ones it appears on the right and somewhat smaller ones, including some wooden ones on the left. Many of them have been converted into commercial businesses. And I'll point out a couple uh, that are of interest. Um, as I mentioned, I'm working on banks. And so this would have been the headquarters for the Merchants and Mechanics Bank. This is the only bank to survive from the pre-war into the post-Civil War period. And then in the distance here, and I show you a close-up uh, detail um, on the right, is an interesting house, um, really uh, not a townhouse, but a, more like a, like, a, um, like a country estate. Um, and it would have been countryside at the time it was built, um, which I am going to refer to as the Aitchison House because it was first owned by uh, uh, a landowner named William Aitchison. And that's, and you can see the spelling, I'm sorry, in the caption. Um, or actually, you can't, so uh, I'll spell it A I T C H E S O N. Um, he leased this house very early on to a succession of banks. And so it started off as the Bank of the United States, or what we think of as the first Bank of the United States between 1800 and 1803. And then it became the Bank of Virginia after the Bank of the United States moved out. And that was a state chartered bank between 1806 and 1815. Then when it was vacant again, and the Bank of the United States, first Bank of the United States had folded and then reopened as the second Bank of the United States, it was headquartered there again between 1818 and 1836. Then when Andrew Jackson closed down the Bank of the United States, it became home to another state charter bank called the Exchange Bank of Virginia. All of that to say, there was a lot of banking and commercial activity along um, uh, this uh, series of blocks uh, leading northward right here. And this country estate dating from about 1796 uh, was the origin uh, for all of that commercial activity. Banks allowed Norfolk to grow and to prosper uh, in a state where frankly, um, uh, these kinds of institutions were looked upon with suspicion by uh, the gentry. And so it took a while for banking really to take hold in Virginia. Okay. My focus is going to be today, or rather my focus today is going to be on the fine arts. And I say this um, with a, a kind of a, a footnote here. It's um, a category of activity just emerging from the broader context of early American material culture. Okay, and so defining material culture, the everyday objects and object making mostly useful, mostly functional that ordered daily life. And as a way of kind of probing a little deeper, there is a lot of object making going on in the borough, although we might not classify it as fine art. So I picked a random page out of the 181 Norfolk Business Directory. And if you look at the O's and the P's, we can see a pretty rich sampling of the kinds of activities that are going on in the borough. And men and women are engaged. Um, free black men and free black women and white men and white women are engaged um, as well. And the professions include jeweler, shipwright, house carpenter, tanner and rope maker, shoemaker, tin plate worker, and seamstress. The fine arts activities of painting, sculpture, and printmaking um, are not really in evidence here for reasons I'll explain. Um, but at the time, we're almost exclusively male and white. We do have a, a there's a known handful of women 
painters, for example, in the early part of the 19th century, not active here, and at least one African-American painter active in the Baltimore area, Joshua Johnston, um, from the time period that I'm talking about. So the, um, when compared to larger urban centers during the colonial and the early Republican periods, Norfolk was pretty slow to recognize the value and the importance of the fine arts. Um, even as some other activities like architecture, building uh, trades and the like, and even theater are taking off here. And I mention um, um, the larger urban centers and um, you know this early map uh, from 1814, uh, which I've you know, added the, uh, the key to the right, you know, showing Boston, New York, Philadelphia, where a whole lot is actually going on. Uh, Baltimore, a uh, substantial amount, Charleston and Savannah, um, maybe a little less so, but uh, also significant um, uh, centers of artistic activity. And so who are the artists working in these areas outside of the Northeast? Generally, we would call them traveling or itinerant artists. They're moving around in search of work and most importantly, in search of paying patrons. Some of them are born here in the US, some are born abroad and come to the US in search of opportunity. They travel by ship, on horseback, later even by rail. I included this nice uh, sort of uh, folk painting right here showing a very early example of a, um, of a, uh, a railroad uh, in Connecticut. And um, they, um, they, st they stay for a while and then they move on. And so uh, to backtrack in a little more than 200 years, um, one of the first artists active in Norfolk is a guy named John Durand. He's European trained, based in New York. He visits Norfolk in 1770. He paints this portrait of a civic leader, Thomas Newton uh, Jr. and the Newton family, big movers and shakers in the early part of Norfolk's history, including um, holding a number of federal and congressional appointments. Um, Painting portraits, images of people, is the bread and butter of the traveling artists. You can make uh, sketches in uh, graphite or charcoal, in watercolor, um, uh, sometimes uh, what we would think of as miniatures, uh, little lockets and the like, and then, uh, as in this case, a uh, more or less full-scale oil painting at three-quarter length. And artists would, by the way, charge by the square inch. And so if you want a bus portrait uh, cut off at the chest, that would be far less than a half length, less than a three quarter length, and the most expensive being a full length. You've probably heard of the painter Thomas Sully. Uh, he actually passes through Norfolk uh, between 1801 and 1803. He's a very young man at the time. He is still learning to be an artist. He's attached to a larger theater family that is active in town. And um, uh, after beginning to learn his, you know, to apply his trade, uh, he goes on to greater renown in Philadelphia and in New York. Uh, but he always has kind of a, an eye on Norfolk, it seems, at least in terms of uh, making connections for some of his artist friends. Now, the most prolific early artist, and again, and this is all kind of background to the 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 period, uh, was a guy named Cephas Thompson. Uh, he is from New England um, and uh, he comes to Norfolk between December 1811 to June 1812 and he is a very very busy guy. He claims to have completed more than a hundred likenesses. Now uh, likely this includes miniatures all the way to the uh, half length and larger subjects that you see on the screen and this is essentially where my interest in all of this artistic activity intersects with the banks. Uh, because I'm showing you on the screen, Cephas Thompson's portraits of Thomas Williamson and his second wife, Anne Walk Williamson. Uh, he paints these um, during that 11, 1811, 1812 uh, time period, and they are currently in the collection of Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, Williamson, is notable because he is the cashier, very important officer position for the Bank of Virginia, that state chartered bank 
that I mentioned earlier. And he becomes very friendly with Cephas Thompson. It is claimed that uh, he ordered a he ordered Cephas Thompson to create a self-portrait, so portrait of the artist, uh, which does not evidently survive. Um, and he begins to build an art collection. Uh, it's even later in uh, his career that Williamson becomes a kind of amateur architect uh, as well. So what does Norfolk look like at this point in time? I'm going to shift briefly uh, to an architect. His name is Benjamin Henry Latrobe, and he provides us with some really beautiful images of uh, the borough around the year 1796. It's a little bit earlier, but uh, it'll give us uh, uh, some good background information. Um, Latrobe uh, is English born. Uh, he has a sort of minor architecture, uh, architectural career before coming to the US and then he begins to build his reputation. He lands in Norfolk in March of 1796, he stays for a couple of weeks. Then he goes on to Richmond. He circles back to Norfolk for a little while uh, but then he moves from Richmond on up to Baltimore, Philadelphia, and uh, then um, most famously in Washington, D.C., where he becomes a supervising architect for the U.S. Capitol, also has a hand in the design of the, the expansion really of the White House. Okay, so what Latrobe leads, uh, leaves us uh, from this early visit to Norfolk, he, steps off the ship here. So this is the international point of arrival. Um, and he begins sketching some beautiful images. Um, I'm just showing three from Norfolk uh, immediate vicinity, uh, but he also sketches, I should mention Cape Henry, the lighthouse um, out there. Um, uh, further inland, um, all the way up to Richmond. Um, lots of views, some taken from um, the ship as he is um, uh, passing by a scenic wonder and then sometimes uh, sketching on land. What we have here are two views and I'm going to point out, uh, by the way, this is a, a portrait of Latrobe as um, painted by uh, Charles Wilson Peel. Uh, this now hangs in the White House actually. This is a view of the Elizabeth River standing roughly, if you were downtown, uh, near the pier where the Wisconsin is now birthed. So imagine standing, let's say, on the Freemason side um, uh, at the edge of uh, at the edge of that berth, looking downriver, which paradoxically, because Elizabeth goes from south to north, we would think of as more like upriver, but it's really downriver. Okay, and you can see it's bucolic, even sort of pastoral uh, kind of scene uh, with a um, uh, number of um, smaller uh, sailing vessels and larger sailing ships and a view of the densely uh, wooded um, uh, shoreline across the river uh, from some uh, sort of grassy uh, banks on the Norfolk side. Okay, now in the second view, and this is hard to uh, sort of reconcile because I think, um, sorry, um, Latrobe and his descriptions maybe conflate some things, but supposedly he moves from here, which would be here in this view, steps back and takes in a larger view. And what is so remarkable about this scene is how desolate it appears. So what happened in 1776 at the start of the American Revolution uh, to prevent the British um, from capturing Norfolk, the residents fled the city and burned it behind them. Um, and so the, um, really for decades uh, following that event, um, parts of the city were just marked by these standing chimneys. Um, so essentially imagine there would have been a wooden house attached to this one and possibly to this one. More substantial brick building is just a ruined hulk there on the left. Okay, let's fast, Let's go on to the third view, though, and the one that's most frequently reproduced. Um, and this is a view of Norfolk from Smith's Point. Sometimes it's referred to as Town Point, uh, but really Smith's Point. So Smith's Creek is now what we call the Hague today. 
And um, uh, my sense of this location is it's roughly maybe where the PETA building is uh, downtown looking upriver, which would be south. And then you can see the full expanse of the city, including um, the, uh, the harbor uh, with its many masted uh, sailing vessels. And uh, it's a kind of uh, reassuring site after the devastation of the previous uh, site here that the city is beginning to come back. And it's mostly in this area that the, uh, the ruins are still prevalent. Another sketch that, uh, that Latrobe made, and, and kind of a useful one for this talk, is this uh, sort of interesting view of, the, um, of the, uh, the harbor itself. So the downtown waterfront filled with um, finger-like piers that would extend uh, into the river and quite a number of vessels um, berthed and you know, casks of rum and other uh, goods being unloaded. Um, but more important, I think what's, what was, or let's say what's kind of interesting is, you know, some activity shown, but lots of gossiping going on among the crews, among the merchants uh, who are, um, um, you know, commissioning uh, the ships and, and sending them uh, mostly in the triangle trade between um, the Caribbean and uh, here in North America and then uh, to England. Okay, so I mentioned, uh, or Gay mentioned in, in, in the introduction, there was a period of prosperity that uh, began to uh, be felt in the city around 1819, 1820, largely because a lot of the trade restrictions that had followed the War of 1812 had been lifted finally, and the ports were again uh, filled with vessels and uh, the kind of mercantile trade uh, that kept the local economy going. So in the center of all of this is our friend Thomas Williamson, Thomas Williamson, uh, whom I mentioned earlier, and here's his portrait by Cephas Thompson again, uh, he became a kind of social and cultural nexus. He, along with his wife, Anne, and I should mention uh, their country estate, Ferry Farm, or Ferry Plains sometimes it's referred to, is out in Princess Anne County, and it is still there today, but the house itself is not, okay? So you can go visit Ferry Plantation in Virginia Beach, but the house that stands there now dates from about 1830. The earlier house that uh, Thomas and Anne occupied, shown in this drawing by their son, a um, uh, slightly different uh, profile um, near the site where the current house stands, uh, but it had burned in a fire in 1828-29, somewhere around then. Um, and so Imagine then um, this kind of uh, bifurcated uh, lifestyle, which would be common for um, um, you know, the, uh, the gentry of the era, um, a place in town and then a place outside of town. And uh, to call Ferry Plains a plantation, probably a bit of an exaggeration. The soil is not all that great in uh, that part of Princess Anne County. And so it's likely really more a small farm. Into this, we have a new um, uh, personality to introduce and his name is William Dunlap. Dunlap is useful for a number of reasons. He's a real catalyst for activity. Uh, he is um, also a diarist of considerable note, and he leaves us with some really tantalizing glimpses of what life was like through these detailed entries. And, you know, it might often start off with, you know, I got up this morning and, you know, did this and that, but then when we find out through the day who we met with and where he dined and what he thought of the local theater and so on and so forth, a pretty interesting picture begins to emerge. So who is this William Dunlap? Um, he first arrives in October 1819. Uh, seems to be on the recommendation of um, uh, Thomas Sully, uh, who he would have known from up north. He's based in um, New York, although born in New Jersey. He also had some training in London, 
with the expatriate artist Benjamin West. So all of that is kind of makes for an interesting um, and you know, for an artist of the time period, a pretty cosmopolitan uh, background. Uh, he has this interest in theater, which he develops and he plies for quite a while, actually dropping uh, painting as his main profession until um, around 1817, he decides to go back to painting after um, an unsuccessful episode in the theater uh, in New York. With that, um, he begins traveling. And uh, even an artist as accomplished as Dunlap with the training that he had in London um, really needed to hunt down clients. Uh, you probably notice that there's a kind of strange appearance to his right eye. Um, he is um, very forthright in this uh, miniature portrait, a little watercolor on ivory. Um, uh, he sustained an injury to his right eye as a child and he, um, uh, he, he paints it. So um, Dunlap, as I um, indicated earlier, um, one of a number of interconnected artists, and when I say interconnected, I mean, they all seem to know each other, they correspond with each other, they recommend places where um, they might visit in search of work. And um, uh, he, is, um, he is a networker, uh, we might say in uh, 21st century. Uh, parlance. So he arrives on a steamship, actually. It's already beginning to be the, uh, uh, the transition from sail to steam um, from Baltimore. Uh, he reconnects with another local artist. I don't have a portrait of him, unfortunately. I don't know that one exists. His name is John Crawley. He's a local portrait painter, but he too is also traveling around. He, like Dunlap, Crawley like Dunlap, um, a kind of entrepreneur. And so, for example, uh, earlier, um, Crawley, uh, acting as, I guess, really kind of a fine arts broker, had brought to Norfolk these two rather well-known paintings by an artist named John Vanderlyn, um, and notorious uh, for, I think you can probably guess, uh, for the uh, female nudity of the image on the left and the, uh, you know, the half-clothed uh, male, the male nude on the right. Uh, these are uh, two historical paintings by Vanderlyn. Um, <clears throat> the left is Ariadne asleep on the island of Naxos, and um, the right is Caius Marius amid the ruins of Carthage. Um, Crawley opened a gallery of paintings uh, on Main Street, and so Main Street, of course, is still uh, there downtown, um, opposite a familiar uh, commercial spot called the Exchange Coffee House. Now, um, to bring paintings in, or to let's say to uh, take paintings on the road as a kind of traveling exhibition was a common activity during this period. It was a way for artists to generate income for themselves, especially if they paint an image like the Ariadne, for example, which there was no actual patron. And so it's a way of recovering costs. And they would charge admission, you know, five, 10 cents and the like. And uh, for propriety's sake, they would generally divide the audiences depending on the subject matter. So there would be male viewing days and ladies and children's viewing days. And um, what I discovered in the newspapers is that um, I guess interest from the ladies dropped off because their days, Tuesdays and Fridays were discontinued in favor of all male viewing days toward the end of the exhibition's run. So that was prior to 1819. Okay, so Dunlap um, is able to sniff out a good client. And so he, uh, at some point, makes the acquaintance of Thomas Williamson and Anne Walk Williamson. Uh, he goes to visit their uh, townhouse uh, in uh, downtown Norfolk. And by the way, I probably didn't stress this enough, um, at some point, Williamson was not just the cashier for the Bank of Virginia, but the resident cashier. So this is a view of the townhouse where they moved after moving out of the Aitchison house that I pointed out earlier. So this is on Main Street, not too far from Bank though. And um, 
he um, has a look at um, Williamson's collection and his estimation of the collection is not that uh, positive. Uh, he says that there are some dozen portraits by Cephas Thompson, a man who cleared $3,700 in five months in this place some years back, vilely bad. Then he mentions um, Crawley. Um, a large picture by Crawley of three children is horrid. The rest of Mr. Williamson's collection is made up of indifferent landscapes and bad copies. The amusing thing about Dunlap's diary is he doesn't hold back. Now, clearly in polite company, he must have because very quickly he becomes very tight friends with both uh, Thomas and Anne uh, Williamson. And likely when he looked at these portraits and they're not maybe the most accomplished, um, but they're not awful either. Um, uh, he must have kept his opinion to himself or one would hope. Okay, so that brings me to Joshua Shaw. Okay, so already Dunlap has arrived in October of 1819. Crawley is already here. Shaw arrives in December and you begin to wonder like how, this is a pretty small borough, how many um, you know, artists can be active here without exhausting uh, the, um, uh, well, emptying the pockets of potential patrons. Well, um, it's interesting. Uh, Shaw has a somewhat different purpose. He is more a landscape artist than anything else. And he is on a money-making venture. If nothing else, these artists are very entrepreneurial folks. Um, a subscription series of landscape prints that he would sell um, to, um, uh, to customers. And so you would um, essentially buy a subscription and then uh, every other month or maybe every three months or so receive a print to add to your portfolio. He's going to call the whole thing picturesque views of American scenery, and he does publish it between 1820 and 1821. He described um, to his uh, publisher that he was uh, uh, focusing uh, his efforts among the prudent and the wealthy. And um, uh, when he arrives in town, it's not anyone, it really shouldn't surprise us at this point that he found uh, Mr. and Mrs. Williamson. Now, here's the thing, uh, Dunlap, if you thought that he found um, uh, a long departed artist like Cephas Thompson to be irritating, uh, found you know having a um, uh, rival uh, right there in town with him, uh, in addition to Crawley, uh, to be uh, doubly irritating. And I'm gonna try to get this passage right because it's subtle and it involves a Cockney accent. So he writes in his diary, Crawley, okay, so our local artist, brings Shaw in from the North, the miniature painter to see me. He is just from Baltimore. He is an ignorant, conceited English blockhead. Talks being once talks of being once consumptive, and the doctor told him he must change his air, and it seems to be a play on hair and air at the same time. And uh, I can just imagine him. Um, well, let's just say um, I bet it was amusing, or at least it was amusing to him when he wrote it down. It wouldn't be uh, long though uh, before. Um, uh, you know, Shaw really does connect uh, very strongly uh, with Williamson. So uh, he has all of the requirements of a potential client. He has deep pockets and appreciation for fine art. And for um, Shaw, who's a landscape painter, he's got access to the countryside now. And so six days later, um, we find out from Dunlap that uh, he had called at Williamson, found Shaw and Crawley with him, and that Shaw, that Williamson had already taken Shaw to his country seat and Shaw had made some sketches. So he really wasted no time. In any case, um, all of this is happening in 1819 in a very short space of time. Uh, winter descends on the barrow. The friendship between Dunlap and Williamson deepens. They meet and they dine together several times a week. 
uh, sometimes with Mrs. Williamson, sometimes um, alone. On at least one occasion, they play backgammon together. There are ups and downs. At one point, Williamson offers to build a painting room at a dwelling house for Dunlap, but another, they disagree over a price for a family group commission. Uh, Crawley is kind of in the background at this point. Um, Dunlap writes in his diary that Crawley seems uneasy when Williamson mentioned that I had thought of coming here to live. Hmm, interesting. In late January, Williamson at last gets an invitation to Ferry Plain, so out to the estate, which um, Dunlap described in his diary as situated on an inlet called a river and looking like a beautiful small lake. This is revealing, okay, the inlet called a river looking like a beautiful small lake is Lynn Haven Inlet in Princess Anne County in Virginia Beach. And so think of crossing the Lesnar Bridge and that vast expanse of water um, on the land side leading deep into the neighborhoods of Virginia Beach. This is where um, uh, the Williamsons spend uh, their weekends and Shaw finds to be captivating for his picturesque views and Dunlap finds to be rather captivating as well. Um, now, Dunlap continues to correspond with um, Thomas Sully, um, mentioned him earlier, and um, I guess remembering that uh, Crawley had done so well uh, with um, the uh, Vanderlyn uh, paintings coming through town, he uh, offers to uh, be the broker for a large scale history painting by Thomas Sully in town. Uh, it's called The Passage of the Delaware, 1819. It's a view of um, uh, Washington uh, crossing the Delaware during the Revolutionary War. It's not the famous one uh, by Emmanuel Lloyds, but it's still a pretty famous painting. And um, uh, Sully was going to come with the painting himself in March, 1820, but decided instead to stop in Baltimore. He sent the painting on. Dunlap receives it. Dunlap writes in his diary, Sully's picture is finer than I had first thought. The horses are admirable, the whole composition grand, the distance sublime. And I think we can agree. I mean, it's really quite an accomplished uh, work, especially in uh, the way that the foreground subject, the view into the distance, and then that uh, rather deep landscape um, um, really kind of captures the drama of the event. Okay, so with that, Dunlap engages a room to exhibit the painting. He charges admission and uh, he writes a review of it in the paper. And uh, the whole thing is a big success because in just over a week, he collects $116 in admission fees uh, for this painting. And that's quite a bit if you're, you know, if the average uh, admission fee is well under a dollar. A lot of people came to see it, in other words. Okay, so what's happening uh, now? So Shaw has since left. He's gone on to other places to sketch. He comes back. Um, this after um, time actually in the Deep South. Uh, following an evening visit uh, to Crawley's in early April, so Crawley's house at this point, Dunlap writes in his diary, Shaw came in, just returned from Savannah, Augusta, et cetera, and represents the South as a paradise of riches. Okay, so with that, Dunlap wraps up his stay, uh, which has been about six, seven months. Uh, he departs for points north toward the end of April, 1820, shake hands with Williamson and a few others. He wrote goodbye to Norfolk for the present. But it's not over because um, Dunlap comes back in November, 1820. He seems to like uh, uh, spending the winters in a warmer climate. Uh, he holds an exhibition of 60 of his paintings in Norfolk, again, in a rented room, including his first historical composition um, uh, with an accompanying catalog that he, that he wrote and then had printed um, in a specially rented room that he called his new gallery. Okay. He began work on a second historical composition, um, and I show it to you here. It's called Christ Rejected. And it's a scene from the New Testament, um, right around the, uh, the beginning of uh, uh, the Passion leading to uh, 
um, Good Friday and, and Easter. Um, and it's actually directly based on a work by his mentor, Benjamin West. He leaves in spring 21 and comes back. And he brings the, um, uh, the painting back with him. Um, but he's beginning to feel a little less optimistic about Norfolk. I think he's exhausted his clientele um, or potential clientele at this point. And um, his diary entries are not as interesting or as lively as before. Uh, so for example, when he comes back in um, the, uh, the fall of 21, he writes, the place becomes more and more desolate, but I hope to find portrait painting enough here and in the neighborhood to support me while I finish my picture. And again, it says Christ rejected, which this is the sketch version. Um, and um, he would work on a larger version while he was here as well. Um, now, true to his word, um, he does um, scout for new commissions. He goes as far south as Elizabeth City. And then to the, to the northwest, he goes up the James River and stops at a variety of the plantations, including Westover, uh, for commissions. <clears throat> okay, so what about this Christ rejected? Okay, this is again the sketch version. So an oil sketch on canvas, he planned one that would have been enormous. Um, or was enormous, um, 18 feet by 12 feet. He bought a special canvas from Sully, uh, who also dealt in art supplies back in New York. And um, he started work in the summer of 1821 in New York. And then he was very happy to come down to Norfolk because he had more room to work on it. And you can imagine this, that's a considerably large painting and uh, would not uh, easily fit inside even a normally sized um, uh, uh, public room. So when he returns and with his, uh, with his larger canvas um, and still has a sketch to work from, uh, he writes, I had a better place in Norfolk than my New York garret to work on the picture. Okay, so he's at work on the picture. And uh, meanwhile, uh, John Crawley is at work. Um, Shaw is really pretty much out of the scene at this point, but we'll come back to him in a second. Uh, Crowley places his prominent newspaper advertisement in November, um, indicating uh, that he is opening um, a school for drawing and painting, and uh, it's on Church Street, another major street downtown, roughly St. Paul's Boulevard today, and uh, he's charging tuition and his hours and he, of course, is still painting portraits um, in any manner at reduced prices. Okay, that's not maybe the best uh, sign. Um, late December, again, uh, of 1821, uh, Dunlap was about to reopen his gallery, again, showing his pictures. Um, Crawley makes a counter move. Um, he opens his own museum. Crawley has opened his museum, um, Dunlap writes in his diary, and for uh, first three days and evenings received an average of $18 um, uh, per day. Um, funny, he doesn't seem a little too concerned, but uh, uh, then he writes, I've advertised that my gallery is open without mentioning my large picture. I will let it be seen in an unfinished state and the other pictures are as last year. So he's recycling the same exhibition uh, with, um, with the, uh, the new uh, work in progress. Um, then in January, so now we're in, in 1822, my exhibition yields a little, partly owing to advertising in the Beacon local newspaper, which I do on account of painting for the printers. So in exchange for painting portraits, he's now getting uh, some free advertising. Okay, then in early February of 1822, Dunlap with some satisfaction writes, my picture continues to grow and my exhibition yields something daily. So he's still making a bit of money and he's still satisfied with his work on the large Christ rejected. Here's, I guess, where I, I, I what I find remarkable. We have two um, very active artists in the city at the same time, each of them 
running galleries. If that is not the beginning of what I would think of as a um, substantial art scene in the city, I can't think of what other marker uh, we would want. It's still early for museums uh, to, be, uh, to be founded. Um, it's true though, we do not have an art school other than the kind of instruction that Crawley um, appears to be giving in his studio. Okay, Dunlap, um, Ever the Entrepreneur, decides to bring in another painting for uh, traveling painting for exhibition. It's uh, another work by Sully, it's called the Capuchin Chapel, and it's a copy of an historical religious painting by uh, French artist Francois Marius Brenet. Um, and again, this is Sully's version of Brenet's painting, um, and um, evidently earned about $200 in two weeks of exhibiting this particular work. And something of a mystery, by the way, I cannot seem to track down where the Sully version of the Capuchin Chapel um, is located, what permanent collection, or if in fact it has disappeared uh, to, um, uh, to history. Okay, so all the while, um, Williamson and Dunlap are still continuing to socialize. In the borough at Ferry Plains, um, also um, um, travels up and down the James River. Um, finally, 3rd of June, 1822, he writes, I left Norfolk, I presume, for the last time. Um, about a dozen years later, he would reminisce in another um, essay, though it is his home to me. Um, um, excuse me. He said, I left Norfolk, I presume, for the last time, though it is his home to me. Um, but he also writes in that, um, that uh, essay, I gave Williamson a portrait of myself, not sure where that exists, and the original sketch of the Christ rejected, in which, as I remember them, the, the uh, uh, figure of Mary Magdalene is abominably bad, poor thing, and I had no power to make her better. Um, and then he writes, and this is getting a bit into the weeds, but I think it's interesting just to see how artwork travels at this point. I engaged a young Irishman of the name of Doherty who aspired to be a painter to take charge of the Christ rejected and shipped it by way of Baltimore for Philadelphia where I had engaged Sully and another artist gallery at $10, and $10 a week. My other pictures I shipped by sea to New York. And so it's a really, it's quite a production, um, disassembly an artist studio. Um, the Dunlap self-portrait, no idea where it is. The large scale Christ rejected, the 12 by 18 foot version, no idea. But this smaller oil sketch, which I've shown you in a couple of slides, even with the bad figure of Mary Magdalene, <laughs> um, ends up in the collection of the Princeton University Art Museum. Um, how and why, I don't know. And uh, I've even been in touch with descendants of the Williamsons. They have no idea because they have no uh, family connection to Princeton either. On the back of this painting, this oil sketch, um, Dunlap uh, inscribed it to Williamson. This, the original sketch of my Christ rejected, is presented to my friend T. Williamson as a testimony of gratitude and esteem by W. Dunlap, Norfolk, May 1822. So I'm going to wrap up um, in just a couple of slides. All this while, Joshua Shaw had been back north taking his sketches that he made up and down the East Coast and working with a Philadelphia printmaker, turning them into um, the uh, scenes that would be um, added to the subscription portfolio, the picturesque views of American scenery. Um, We've already looked at the view of downtown Norfolk. It's a relatively compact place in um, Shaw's view. And I remind you that we're looking at a different angle from the earlier, more expansive view from Latrobe. This is roughly from downriver. So to the north from roughly Ghent and The Hague looking toward downtown. This is from the south from the shoreline of Portsmouth looking north. Uh, to the uh, really the tip of downtown here. The two additional views that um, Shaw produced are of the Lynnhaven River. 
And this is kind of curious. Um, I probably should have inserted a map here, but I'll leave it to your imagination. If you can think of the Lynn Haven Inlet from the Lesnar Bridge and that great expanse of water, and then these smaller branches that go deep into Virginia Beach's neighborhoods, there is a place called Church Point, which is slightly elevated. This seems to be the spot where Shaw produced these two views. He refers to the location as an eminence, in other words, a rise. And um, he said that he took one view in one direction and the other view in the opposite direction. Um, and so the view looking outward toward the mouth of the Lynn Haven Inlet and the Chesapeake Bay with a, kind of a few views of ships in the horizon seen here on the left, roughly the same view as I had taken it myself um, uh, a few years ago, turning around in the other direction and it is not maybe quite so easy to see. This has all been built up now with suburban houses, but a small inlet corresponding to a um, uh, feature that he's calling Oyster Cove. In both cases, we have conventional European picturesque landscape devices, um, dramatic sky framed by copses of trees, broken shoreline, um, and a nice foreground that situates um, a uh, point of lookout uh, for the viewer. Possibly even more dramatic here because of the uh, inclusion of the um, um, uh, the deer waiting in the um, in the water. So uh, Shaw comes back uh, to. I mentioned uh, that the portfolio uh, picturesque views of American scenery is uh, published in 1820-21, but he does come back actually in 1822 with a little guidebook uh, to all the places that he went to visit. Uh, he calls this the United States Directory for the Use of Travelers and merchants, and in it, he describes Norfolk in the following way. It's the principal mart for commerce in Virginia, possessing a greater share of it than any other part, any other port in that state. The harbor is safe and commodious, will contain 300 ships, and is deep enough for the largest vessels. For those of you interested in, in um, resilience planning and the like, this is interesting. The situation of Norfolk is low, and in some places, marshy. The streets are well paved and lighted, though the houses are not remarkable for elegance. It contains a theater, three banks, an academy, a marine hospital, orphan asylum, Lancastrian school, Athenaeum, and six houses of public worship. Okay, all of this is quite um, informative though, because um, I mentioned the 18-1 business directory, there's another one put out in 18-6, and then there's a big gap. And so um, this 1822 description is really quite useful for any historian. Um, interested in what's happening in the borough. I will mention one final note though. In his um, directory, he mentions um, or he lists the inhabitants and it would seem that by the latter part of 1822, Dunlap's departure, that things really have begun to slow down for artists in the borough. Um, his friend John Crawley, who had helped connect him to Williamson and to Dunlap and to so many things uh, happening in the borough, is listed in the directory as an artist and the proprietor of a boarding house. So with that, um, I think there should be some time for questions. I thank you all for your time. Thank you, Robert, for that wonderful presentation. Oh, there I am. Sorry, my, my screen froze for a moment. <laughs> but yes, thank you so much. That was really incredible. Um, we do have some questions coming in through the chat. Um, so let me start off with the first one I see. Besides, uh, thank you, that was very interesting. Um, no questions, truly fascinating presentation. 
but here's one question. Was the Moses Myers house a prominent house during this time? I want to actually go back to sharing my screen for a second. I may. Yeah, so let's see. You'll recall that this is Bank Street. Mentioned the William Aitchison House. This is actually located today underneath MacArthur uh, Center. You can't see it here, oddly enough, and the street does bend. It was actually, uh, there used to be a bridge here. There used to be an inlet of water here. That's why City Hall Avenue floods. Um, you can't see it from this view, but there's actually uh, the MacArthur uh, Memorial, uh, originally in Norfolk uh, Courthouse and City Hall. Uh, is behind this roof line here. If you were to go back behind the Aitchison house, the next major house in the block would be the Myers house. And so that still stands and it's on the opposite side of um, MacArthur Center and Bank Street does continue uh, for about a block and a half in that direction. So yes, uh, to your answer, Linda. Um, in fact, this house and the Myers house would have been almost exact contemporaries uh, the Myers house may be a little bit more up-to-date looking, uh, a little more stylish. Great, um, thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, you've mentioned in your presentation that this was an offshoot from a larger book project on Norfolk's bank architecture during the antebellum period. What got you inspired or curious to examine Norfolk's art scene and first artistic awakening 200 years ago? Oh, um, well, I, I guess it actually is, is, is relatively more straightforward or, or less interesting than it sounds. Um, I became interested mainly because of this guy, Williamson. Um, and I will say that um, uh, Quite by accident, I happened to be in um, Williamsburg up at the DeWitt Wallace um, um, Gallery last summer, and lo and behold, the uh, Williamson and 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 Mrs. Williamson were both on display as part of an exhibition about uh, traveling artists. But even before that, um, it was this idea that. Um, even in early American society, in order for the arts to grow and flourish, you needed people with deep pockets or um, the activity does not, um, let's put it this way. In an ordinary household, you fill it with useful things. What the shoemaker, what the seamstress, um, what the cabinet maker, um, you know, what the uh, tin plate maker and so forth um, uh, produce for your cupboard, for your dresser, um, the idea of hanging things in the walls becomes a kind of additional luxury or flourish that few people can afford. And then almost immediately when they do, um, it's, um, it, it can suddenly take off. So for example, um, going back to Linda's question about the Myers house, uh, two show pieces in the Myers house, and I do recommend if you haven't visited, please go, um, are portraits by uh, Gilbert Stewart of Moses and Eliza Myers, okay? The Myers ordered portraits from Cephas Thompson too. I have no idea where they are or if they survived. Maybe they're still in the Myers family. Um, but clearly, you know, they got their Cephas Thompson portraits and I'm not sure, the date is kind of ambiguous on this Gilbert Stewart portraits. Maybe they upgraded to the Stewart portraits afterwards or maybe they just decided they wanted a couple of extra or whatever, um, you know, once you become a collector in the fine arts, it's kind of hard to put a stop to it. it becomes a bug, let's, let's call it that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see, another question we have is uh, the competition and rivalry that existed between Dunlap and Crawley was particularly interesting. Um, have you been able to pinpoint where the galleries were located? Um, were they close in proximity to one another? Um, was there any indication of an artistic corridor or specific area of Norfolk during this period? 
No, it's, it's kind of hard to pinpoint where they were. Um, the reference to the Exchange Coffee House is, is kind of uh, important. Okay, so the Exchange Coffee House is a major center of just blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, it's where people gathered. Um, it, obviously, they bought coffee there, but I think they also uh, did other things. And my suspicion is when uh, they formed the Exchange Bank much later, they name it after the Exchange Coffee House. And the word exchange just kind of means you know, commerce um, uh, back in the day, think of stock exchanges uh, today. Um, so that was located roughly where, um, oh, um, the Hilton Main on Main Street uh, is located. Um, and so we have kind of a, a, a location for that first uh, exhibition space. Um, when Crawley says that he's opening on Church Street, that's further down by St. Paul's Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit away from the center part of town, but still you know, pretty centrally located. I mean, nothing's terribly far from each other. And almost always, these are going to be like upstairs rooms in townhouses or by the 1820s, you're beginning to have your first light industrial commercial buildings. Um, they could be a more substantial structures at that point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I thought I heard somebody starting to say something, but um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I guess I'll go on to this next question, which is, um, in your presentation, you shared doing research in libraries and museums. Can you share about your research project? Um, particularly with surviving material culture and art during this period? Um, were you at all surprised at what you were able to find to piece together um, the art scene 200 years ago? Interesting. Um, that came together relatively quickly. Um, there is, um, I, I don't have time to pull it up really quickly. Uh, there is a mystery uh, painting in the Chrysler Museum's permanent collection that is in some ways the genesis of all of this. Um, and those of you who know Mark Lewis, uh, who's the chief conservator there, I had a little uh, photograph of him working on uh, uh, a painting earlier in the presentation. Um, he sent me a note one day saying, I have this interesting portrait. Let's, uh, why don't you come down and let's uh, figure out who it is. And we still do not know uh, who it is, which is a little frustrating, uh, but I'm pretty sure that at some point I will um, uh, solve the mystery. And I think I may be able to pull it off as I'm yakking. Uh, the work is by Crawley. The date on it is, um, a little challenging, it's 1829 and it is dated um, and it is signed, but who the artist, um, excuse me, who the subject of the painting is, is left uh, to our imagination because there is absolutely no identity. It is a youngish man um, who is um, shown in workman's clothes and um, here we go. I'm going to get it to you in just a second. Um, okay, I can share my screen again. What I like about him is he's clearly wants to be seen as an architect. Uh, because he has a very uh, sort of elegant drawing in hand with what appears to be the floor plan of the building. And yet at the same time, he's also showing himself off as this buff workman with his sleeve rolled up and, you know, pretty, you know, powerful uh, display of arm there. And the challenge is I cannot find an active architect in Norfolk at the right age that could represent who this guy is. And by the way, you can also see the outline of a column in the background, generally a, um, you know, a kind of an allegory, you know, the emblematic symbol of, uh, you know, integrity, strength, that sort of thing. Um, but also uh, just a reference to, you know, what he's, uh, what he's interested in. Um, my hunch is this guy is about 30 years old. 
looking were people nodding yes no yeah and and it just doesn't quite fit with anybody that i can place but that got us talking about crawley and then i connected crawley to dunlap and then dunlap to williamson and then suddenly shaw appeared and we had this idea for just a like a much larger kind of exhibition and then we decided to give it some focus we would stick with shaw the three landscapes bring in the contemporary piece tie it in with resilience issues here at Hampton Roads, which are considerable and of course of interest to the general public. And uh, at some point later, uh, we may solve uh, the mystery of who this guy is. I hope so. Yeah, but uh, you know, could he be um, one possibility, which I haven't quite ruled out is he could be Williamson's son. Um, he is a son who studies art with Dunlap he has another son who becomes an architect, excuse me, um, yeah, he becomes an architect and teaches at um, um, BMI, actually. The numbers don't quite add up though, because in 1829, that particular son would have been about 19. Could this guy be 19? It's a little bit older to me, but you know, it was a rough life in the 19th century, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll, we'll get to it. Other questions? Uh, it looks like we have about one more and time for one more. So as, as an educator, um, what would you say to students to encourage them to investigate local art history uh, on what they might find around them, like local architecture, material culture, and art collections? That's an excellent question. Um, good example is my hunch is if we were to go knocking on doors all around the area, and when I say the area, because you know, families do move and spread and so forth, we could find a lot of those Cephas Thompson portraits. There are a hundred of them out there. And I would like to see them all together to figure out exactly the kinds of social, and we have the listing of the people that he even painted. Um, you know, has there been a show? No. Not really. Has there been a Dunlap show recently? No. He's more he's more interesting probably today as a diarist than he is as, as an artist. But at the same time, it makes me think, hmm, there's some interesting stuff going on here. Here's the other critical point, though, um, which um, you know I kind of alluded to in that early um, slide showing the Norfolk Directory. There is a lot of activity that falls outside the boundaries of the fine arts. Um, that really allow us to get a more nuanced picture of what people are making and the kinds of things that survive. And so, you know, we know that there, you know, let's say in architectural history, which is my field, you know, we know uh, today, or actually we've known for generations, we just haven't really told the story, uh, that the, the great houses um, uh, in Virginia were largely built with slave labor, um, or if not uh, slave labor, often it's free people who are um, skilled tradespeople, uh, they're plasters or wood carvers or other woodworkers or they're masons, uh, brick masons, stone masons, um, and the like. And um, you know some of the uh, uh, you know the grandest uh, places were built with the humblest of hands. And um, that story needs to come into sharper focus. And you know recently the Chrysler did a nice show uh, actually on uh, Thomas Jefferson and Palladianism and really built out that part of the story in a way that hadn't been told before. So uh, there is lots to look for, but there are even in small everyday objects, um, you know, the spoons and the, uh, the wooden tools and uh, the ironwork and, um, you know, other kinds of things, um, survivors uh, that can be pieced together and, uh, you know, tell us a great deal about how people before us lived. And this is a really rich area for that, really rich area. And we've got outstanding collections. Uh, the Mariners Museum uh, lo loaned us one of the shawl prints um, uh, for the show, but uh, the, you know, the depth of their photography and print collection and map collection, in addition to the nautical and, and, uh, and Mariners uh, related objects um, are, you know, it's the finest collection of its kind. Uh, in the country, add to that Colonial Williamsburg, add to that Jamestown, add to that 
uh, the Chrysler, um, uh, the Hampton University um, Museum collections. Um, this is a this is a really a terrific place. Um, in fact, uh, as I'm thinking this aloud, I'm thinking, hmm, why are we not doing more of museum studies here? That is a good question. Could, happen. Could still happen. Yeah. My dog just decided he wanted to see your presentation too. <laughs> He's trying to jump on my computer. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but thank you. I'll, uh, with that, I will I will wrap up the rest of our presentation today. And I just want to thank you again, Robert, and to sure. everyone else for joining us this afternoon. Um, please check out the rest of the festival if you have a chance. Um, it is, I just added it into the chat box um, uh, for more, and there you can find more information on presentations, virtual tours, um, innovative performances, digital and physical exhibits, and so much more. Um, and please join us again tomorrow, Friday at 10 a.m. for a presentation on food, shelter, water, and art-based research investigation with uh, Dr. Natalia Pilato and her students. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, everyone. That was very well attended. Yay. <laughs>